All right, well, good morning. We're going to get started here. Uh, this is going to be a fun one. You're, you're going to uh, see history repeat itself once again, which we have seen all through the book of Ecclesiastes, but it's really going to hit you hard today. Uh, Scott, would you open us this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us all together. Thank you for having this place for us, Lord. We just ask that you be with us today as we hear the message. Let Harry's words that you speak through him just touch our heart, Lord. Also be the pastor in the service today. And just let us hear the message that you want us to have. We're just so thankful for all that you do. We thank you for your grace, Lord, and, and for the salvation you provide through your son. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, you remember last week in, in chapter 8, now through the end of the book, Chapters 9, 10, 11, 12, he's, he's begun to really move away from kind of looking at and examining the world and why it's doing its thing. And now he's going into rather specific instructions on how people should live. And the interesting thing, of course, about this is that this has been recorded and accepted as Scripture. Thus... We know that all of Scripture is, what does the New Testament call it? Yeah, given. It's God-breathed. So, well, and of course, where did Solomon get his wisdom from? Absolutely. So, we are looking at God's instruction book here, uh, written through, through Solomon. Uh, let's kind of review that first week, chapter 8, uh, where we begin to get some of these instructions. Um, Right off the bat, verse eight, uh, chapter or chapter eight, verse one acknowledges the what of wisdom. The yeah, the value. Wisdom has real value. Being able to take information and make good decisions out of it has good value, does it not? Absolutely. Um, and sometimes it's really hard to make a good decision if you don't have the right information. So it takes it takes, but. There's plenty of people that have all the right information and still make really bad decisions. So that's where wisdom comes in, is to then take that information and make, and he acknowledges right off as he's beginning these last five chapters there in chapter eight with giving instructions, having spent seven chapters of examining and thinking about everything. He says, man, wisdom does have real value. He noticed and he, he want, wants all of us to know that trying to do what with the day of one's death is similar to trying to capture the wind. Trying to control it. Trying to control the day of your death. Yeah. Trying to control that is akin to capturing the wind. Go out. We had a bunch of wind yesterday. Uh, I know when Cindy and I went to bed last night, the wind was howling, you know, past our house. Go out and grab a jar and put it out there and squeeze the top and then open it this morning and nothing. And Solomon says, you know what? Trying to control the day of your death that God has already ordained is just foolish. It's like trying to capture the wind. You can run around and put all kinds of effort into it and you're not going to change it by one second. He also looked at Wickedness and those that, uh, and I just gave that one away, so sorry. Yes. Um, <laughs> what won't give up those that are given to it? Well, that would be wickedness. <clears throat> wickedness is a horrible taskmaster, and it refuses to give up those that are saying, I'm, yeah, I really want to get into being wicked. <clears throat> um, Cindy and I were talking just this morning about the that young 16-year-old boy who killed another 16-year-old boy here at our McDonald's this week and is in the wind somewhere. And, of course, there's great speculation that he might have gone south of the border to get out of the country with relatives and Cindy was saying, what, what's, what's his life going to be like now? Well, we don't know. You know, God can obviously do all kinds of interesting, but... If he gives himself over to wickedness, Solomon says that wickedness will not let him go. And, of course, what's available, well, on any side of the border, really, criminal element, cartels, whatnot. So, yeah, wickedness refuses to give up those that, that really want to go into it. And 
and it waits with open arms for those like him to arrive. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It says more. Bring me more. I'm, I always have room for more. And at the end of the chapter, Solomon, after looking at all of this stuff and talking about these things, he finally comes to the conclusion that God's ways are what? Yeah, mysterious. <laughs> you know what? The wisest man ever to live, who is given God's wisdom, looks at God's methods and says, I don't get it. <laughs> I, I don't understand it. And you'll see that argument made by non-believers all the time. Well, if God's a good God, then why, you know, and fill in the blank. Because God's ways are mysterious. We only can go with the scriptures that we have that says that he's good and that everything he does is good and will have a good outcome at some point. Of course, when do we want the outcomes? Now. Absolutely. Or yesterday. <laughs> or yesterday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so today, I, I've titled the for chapter 9 to live well now and we've seen that focus already out of Solomon a lot in Ecclesiastes have we not yes, yes. He, he's really begun to draw that conclusion he comes back to it we talked about the, the you know the, the season the day all that sort of and we've seen him say that several times where he says you know what quit worrying about all this other nonsense quit chasing the wind trying to control the day your death and enjoy what God has given you as an individual, don't quit, don't try to enjoy what he gave her and we, what he gave him. Enjoy what he gave you today. And if we do that, that leads to what? There's a little homework from a couple weeks ago. If we just focus and enjoy what God's given us today, what's our overall emotion and feeling? Peace. Because <laughs> I quit worrying about all this other nonsense that I can't control anyway. But, man. All right. I don't know how many of you are sci-fi readers. Uh, I was. One of, one of the top art writers out there is Kurt Vonnegut. You may have heard his name. Just a fantastic writer. One of his stories, and is called Harrison Bergeron. If you haven't read it, I advise you to go back. I know this may have been a, a high school reading assignment back in the day for some of you, and you're going, yeah, I think I, you know. He wrote this story back in 1961. So this story is 61 years old. And I'm going to give you kind of a synopsis of it. The story portrays a dystopian, futuristic world. We see that in movies and stuff all the time, you know, this dystopian future world. But in, this, in his story, in this future world, everyone is forced to be equal by the government. Hello. Oh, I haven't even finished yet. <laughs> Man! Strong people must wear weights tied to their body. Smart people wear an earpiece that makes a loud noise in their ear every few seconds to con confuse them and keep them from being able to concentrate. Beautiful people are required to wear masks. The goal is to make sure that no one's feelings get hurt when someone turns out to have an unfair natural advantage. Everyone is equal. Everyone is mediocre. The result is that talent, intelligence, and beauty are suppressed, and the things that we most value are eliminated just simply so that no one's feelings will get hurt. Does this sound eerily familiar? I mean, you all jumped on it before I even got into the rest of it. He wrote this 61 years ago, with having no knowledge of what was coming to American culture in, in 2022. But let me take you back even farther than that. Uh, a French philosopher, Alexis de Tocqueville, wrote in the late 1700s, he came in and began to look at American freedom and American idea of equality and 
what our republic looked like. And this was his quote after he looked at it. He said, Americans are so enamored of equality that they would rather be equal in slavery than unequal in freedom. Would rather be equal as all equal in, in slavery than unequal and free. He said, the Americans are just nuts. Right. He said this almost 300 years ago. So again, we look at our current society, we look at our current arguments, we look at current philosophies we're going on out there, and we want to say, oh, this is all radically new and different, and it's awful. No, no, no. We, we've, we've looked at this path before. So this morning, I want to, and here's one of the words that's being bandied about out there in our society is the word equity. We, we've changed it from equality and gone to this equity thing. So let me give you Solomon's view of true equity. So let's open to Ecclesiastes. We're going to be in chapter 9 today. And somebody want to read me those first four verses, 2 through 6. Go ahead. All share a common destiny. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good man, so with the sinner. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. <clears throat> this is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. That's it. No, no, excuse me. Go ahead. Through six. Sorry. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. So Solomon says, okay, you want equity? You want everybody to have the exact same outcome? He said, that's a done deal. Everybody gets the exact <laughs> same equity in life. Everyone has the same fate. And then he gives these six pairs of opposites. The righteous and the wicked. The good and the bad. Now, good and bad here would be moral versus immoral. The clean and the unclean. Again, think about Jewish law. This is going to be ceremonial cleanliness. Not necessarily somebody's just dirty. This is going to be the ceremonial. People who were very active about keeping themselves ceremonially clean versus those who said, ah, I don't care. I'll touch a grave, I'll, I'll touch a dead person, I'll, then I'll go about my business. Yeah. He said, <laughs> I've got equity for them. And they all show it up. Those who offer sacrifices versus those who don't, this is going to be religious participation. All right, the people that go to church every week, the people that tithe, you know, out of their income every month, they never miss. The people that volunteer every time there's a, a list set up in outside the church and the people that don't do anything the CEO you know you all know what a CEO believer is right Christmas, Christmas, Christmas and Easter only yeah <laughs> and we're coming up on we had one we're coming up on the other one you know my twice a year go to church but he said again both of those end up true equity the good man and the sinner and those that take an oath and those that are afraid, free to take an oath um, this here would be the rash oath versus being afraid of abusing God's name. And he said, I've got equity. He said, I've looked around and there's equity for everything. You want equity? God already designed it. It's a done deal. Now this both raises the question of whether or not righteousness is adequately rewarded and it kind of forces the teacher. Anybody remember his Hebrew name? What teacher? Koalef. Yeah. It forces Koalef, the teacher, to again think about this problem of death. And, and we've seen that he's looked at it several times through the book already. And verse 2 really looks back at the problem of divine justice that we just looked at last week. 
And then it had, looks ahead to the problem of death in these next two verses. Verse 2, everything is the same for everyone. There is one fate for the righteous and the wicked, for the good and the bad. In verses 3 through 6 of what Dana read, the evil, it says that there's this evil, is not simply a natural phenomenon. This, and he considers death an evil. Now, again, as we've seen, what does Solomon have in view in his writings? He's referred back to it a number of times, which is the very beginning, to Genesis. So he's seen the fall in the garden as mankind has been cut off from the tree of life. Mankind can't go in and eat from that tree of life and live forever. But God said, I don't want them living forever in their sin. Now, those of you that were here for the study on Revelation, where do, where do we find the tree of life? Yep, yeah, New Heaven, New Earth, in fact, is that river that says to flow from the throne of God and is lined with, the tree, with trees of life. <laughs> they're just, they're everywhere. So God hasn't gotten rid of it, but he said, I'm not going to have you live forever until you're in this perfect state. So Solomon looks at this as an evil and says, wow, you know, the fact that we're here, and we've been cut off from the tree of life. So what he sees instead is that with this meaning of death, that instead of trying to reckon with it, to do something about it, to make those wise decisions about what you're going to do with your life, People fill their lives with distractions. Again, does this sound anything reasonably like? <laughs> Dad, I'm nervous. Pray for me this morning. Oh, my will. Oh, sorry. We fill our lives with distractions. Now, we have come up with really interesting and quick distractions in our lifetime but is this anything new no, no absolutely not we have always we the collective we humans have always filled our lives with distractions to get our mind off of dealing with this right. fact the reality. the reality that i am not going to be here And we get all tied up in what are oftentimes insignificant worries. Now, at the time, I, I, will, I will own up to this because I do this. Do they seem insignificant at the time? No. No. But then when you get a few years down the road and you look back, you go, oh, man. What was I been out of shape for? So Solomon has written about the way we think and do stuff thousands of years ago, and we're, we're, we're still doing it. Solomon obviously, though, prefers life to death. And we actually talked about this several weeks ago. We quoted one of these verses from at that time. Because he says that a live dog is better than a dead lion. Now, things have changed a little bit concerning dogs from Solomon's time to ours. Uh, those of you who come by the office, particularly on Mondays, a lot of times you will see Amy, my little Boston, who comes with me often on Sunday mornings. Amy Rose. Amy Rose. Yes, that's her name. Um, and if you really want to irritate Cindy, tell her her dog is ugly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But for many of us who have had dogs as pets, they, they are part of our house. They're, we consider them oftentimes a part of our family. Yeah. Some people are, are cat people, some people, but we consider these you know, to be a part of our house. At Solomon's time, not so much. They were unclean animals. Uh, they were scavengers as opposed to the stately king of beasts. So the idea that we think that lions are this stately king is not anything new either. To the people of Solomon's time, man, the male lion was it. That was the epitome of the great, powerful, hunter, stately animal, beautiful animal. Um, in all of my trips to Africa, oftentimes I've gone out on a photo safari because 
virtually every time I've gone, I've taken somebody who hasn't been before, so they want to see the animals. Everything. So we end up scheduling a day or two of going out and looking at that on some of these preserves. My very first trip, we went, and we, as we were heading out, we'd been out for a couple, three days. Um, we had heard the lions roar at night, hadn't seen any. And as we're driving back to this little dirt strip airfield to, to get out of the, this preserve, we came upon a pride of lions laying under a tree right next to the road. Had the kittens with them from that year. The, the offspring from the year before were about 30 yards off just laying there because they're not allowed to come in right next to them, but they wanted to hang out. But we're looking at it and, man! And, and we drove right up on it. We're in open air Jeeps and our driver said, sit very still. As long as you're in this Jeep, they consider you a part of the Jeep. You do not look like a threat or food. And they're used to the Jeeps driving through the preserve. But he said, if you get up and move around, you will break that profile and... Mm. <laughs> so we sat very still. But beautiful animals. This is what they considered lions, but as he looks at those two, this dirty, nasty, unclean scavenger who just runs around and eats garbage and dead things, and this beautiful... He said, you know what? The live dog is better than that dead lion. Because it can still do things. While you're alive, there is still hope. There's always hope while you draw breath. But that vanishes at death. Now, the reason that Solomon has for choosing life, I think, is somewhat surprising. And it's because the living know that they will die. They all know that I'm, I'm going to check out someday. The dead don't know anything, he writes. And over time, they're not even remembered. And, and that's actually kind of true. Cindy and I were having, we were having breakfast this morning. We will put on the, um, that Sunday morning news show. What is that thing, Sid? Um, uh, Channel 5. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday morning. Okay. Sunday morning. Um, and they were talking about the 1918 flu epidemic and how one guy has finally put up a, a marker to commemorate all those people who died. But he said, you know, and one of them was his grandfather or great-grandfather that he had never met because he had died at 35 of that epidemic. But he said, other than these stones, and, and that's what his grandfather had done, was cut the granite that makes those headstones. He said, he said, I remember him because it was my grandpa. I go and clean up the grave. But over time, once I pass, then who? And Solomon looks at all this and says, says, you know what? The dead don't know anything. They're not, going to con they're not learning anything. They're not doing anything. Again, this is a human perspective. And they're not even remembered eventually. Thus his thinking is that the living may yet come to terms with the reality of death. That's why he prefers living. Because I can still come to terms with the reality of death. And if I do that... I can fully embrace the joy that God has to offer me today. And that's what he's trying to teach here. That's what he wrote here. That's what he's trying to teach us is you can come to terms with it and say, okay, this is going to happen, so I need to quit worrying about that. That's chasing the wind. I need to focus on right now and how I'm enjoying what God has blessed me with today. That's what the New Testament is trying to teach us. Constantly. Constantly. Constantly, that while you're alive, you still have hope of making a decision for the Lord. Yep. Right up until we see the thief on the cross, until the last breath. The last breath. Now, the worldly person's gain is only in this life. And when they die, they carry nothing of it with them. I've made that joke often enough times. Um, there is no you all behind a hearse. And so you, I've gained all this stuff, and then what? Somebody else gets it. No such possibility exists for those who have already died. Their time is over. All their love, all their hatred, all their envy dies with them. And note that he picks the three strongest emotions. Love, hate, envy. And he says, those don't survive. 
Those die with that person. The worldly person doesn't know who will get his possession, his lands, his estates, his gold, his silver, whatever of worth and value he had, he has no more interest or control in them. But the good man, Solomon tells us, the good man has possessions that are above the sun because God is his portion and heaven is his inheritance. So the godly person, the person that's come to terms with Reality has come to terms with death, has made that decision, even if it's on their, like the thief on the cross with their last couple of breaths left, his portion is in heaven and his inheritance is forever. So Solomon says, you know what? I prefer life to death because when there's life, there's still hope that this kind of decision can be made. That should really encourage a lot of you that have loved ones and relatives that you've been praying for for years. Because as long as there's breath, hope still exists. But this brings up this question. What should one do being convinced that death is the end for this earthly life? What should somebody do if you are convinced the death is the end for this earthly life. You yeah, you should probably start living. living. Not just existing, living. Yeah. And enjoying the blessings that God has given you as an individual. And using those blessings for the glory of God. Absolutely. Investing those things into something, into something that has eternal value. Quit getting knotted up over the nonsense. I'm talking to me, y'all are just listening. Because <laughs> I get knotted up over the nonsense. Well, Cindy will tell you. She probably won't. Privately. <laughs> <laughs> so with that kind of question in mind, now he goes in starting with chapter, verse 7, and he's going to give us some instructions on how to live. So let me get another reader, 4 verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. Somebody who doesn't read very often. Go ahead. 7, 8, 9, and 10. Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a drink heart. For God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your paying life. He has given you under the sun. Because that is your portion in life, and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Hmm. So, it is with what we just examined, he now gives instructions on how to live, and he returns. Once again, to one of his major themes through all of Ecclesiastes, what we know by its Latin term as carpe diem, which means... Seize the day. Yes. He says, live today, enjoy the simple pleasures, eat your bread, drink your wine with a merry heart. And why? Why? Because God already knows what is occurring in your life. That makes verse 7 my favorite verse. <laughs> <laughs> my new life verse going right there over the, over the kitchen table. <laughs> Remember, honey, what, what, what Harry said in Sunday school, more bread, more wine, let's go. <laughs> yes. So, Sheol is not hell, right? No, it's the place of the dead. One writer put it like this. He said, to rejoice is no sin. To the contrary, God favors what you do. To be happy and rejoice in the blessings that you have, whether they are a lot or a little, whether they feel painful 
or not. He said, that is not a sin to rejoice in what God has allotted you today and enjoy your day today. If Christians aren't showing the joy of today, they aren't making unsaved people want what they've got. Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, going around in misery doesn't compel people, oh, I want to be miserable with you. Well, and how many times does Pastor Jerry say from the pulpit, y'all are looking like poo. <laughs> you smile a little bit. Solomon said that. <laughs> Pastor Jerry didn't say it. <laughs> Solomon said it. He said, it is, we should be out there looking, to, you know, and now it's a little facetious for me, but those of you that have come up to me, and you, I know you all have heard it, hey, how are you doing today? My common phrase, and has been for years and years and years, is another happy day. And I tell myself that based on this teaching and have for years and years. And then people sometimes, because I'll say that when I'm at the grocery store or the bank or something, and that always stops people. Because what do most people say? Bum. Okay. I said, that's another happy day. And that'll catch your attention. Really? I said, well, yeah, because, and then I go into my next line that I already have loaded up and ready. <laughs> because happiness is a choice. It's not based on circumstances. Yes. And that stops them cold every time as they think about it. And usually I'll get a nod. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I said, so it's a happy day because that's my choice. Oh, wow. First, thine is kind of remarkable for a man with a thousand wives. Yeah, we're... we're <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's, let's go with verse 8. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> in verse... Addressing the elephant in the room. Yeah, well, um. <laughs> oh, I had so many smart mouth comments run through my head. I eject, 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 eject. Um, in verse 8, it says, always wear white clothes. The wearing of white clothes and anointing the hair, you know, keeping your, your hair oil, those were symbol, those symbolized at that time in that culture, joy. I'm in a great place. Things are great, so I'm putting on white as opposed to sackcloth and ashes when you were in mourning. And so what does Solomon counsel? What did he tell us? What does the Holy Spirit, through Solomon, writing in a book that we read several thousand years later to Christians operating in 2022 Levine, Arizona, what are you to do even in your clothing? Joy. Absolutely. Oily hair does not make yeah, we're, we're not going to go with some of the cultural things, although some of us that are um, a little gray-haired like myself will remember the days of Brill Cream. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, and just slick that stuff back or uh, the butch wax and sticking that hair straight up. And Some of you younger folks are going, what is butch wax and real green? You, you have Google, I'll let you look it up. But the idea is to go out just even in your clothing, he says, make that show where your attitude is. When he says always, we have to remember that it's in all appropriate times and circumstances. For, and we've already read in Ecclesiastes, both chapter 3, verse 4, and chapter 7, verse 2, that there are times for mourning. Mm -hmm. Right. And we should dress appropriately for that time, but it is a time, and the rest of our life should be characterized by white clothes. <clears throat> the wearing of white clothes, though, it takes enjoyment past, sorry, Dana. It takes it past just eating and drinking. I'm just looking at verse 7. Yeah. <laughs> so white clothing, and we also saw from Revelation, is also a symbol of what? Purity. Absolutely. So we're conducting our lives in such a way that even our clothing goes with that. Remember that Mordecai was honored... Or, um, that's the singer, excuse me, the singers in Solomon's temple, according to 2 Chronicles 5.12, were dressed in white linen. 
because he wanted his singers to be, yeah, these are the, um, okay, again, I'm going to date myself. Y'all remember from the 70s, some of you, some of you weren't born yet, but those of you were, remember that group, Up With People? And their performances were always just, Very upbeat. And that's what Solomon wanted his singers to be. I want you to be, yes, I'm in white. We are happy. We are rejoicing. This is a good place. Mordecai was honored with white clothing by King Ahasuerus in Esther 8.15. Remember, <laughs> he was, the guy wanted to kill him. But the king calls him in and says, hey, what should I do for somebody I want to really honor? And he says, oh, he should be dressed in white and put on a horse and ridden through the town and people should proclaim this is the person that the king wants to honor. And so Mordecai was dressed in white. So this is an ongoing thing. The angels are seen dressed in white. Mark 6, 15, the glorified saints are clothed in white. Revelation chapters in chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and 18. So this idea that Solomon's writing about has to do even with the way you get dressed in the morning. That that should be part of this attitude of joy in today. Now, Solomon especially recommends three areas of joy. The first off is feasting there in verse 7. Go eat your bread with pleasure and drink your wine with a cheerful heart. There you go. Be happy in yourself. Now, I happen to be married to a very good cook. Yes. So I am often very happy when I get called to the table. Every once in a while we have something that I will say, you know what, dads don't like this. <laughs> But I will tell you that is the rare, that is the rare exception. Enjoy your time at the table. How many, what do Americans tend to do though with meals? Rush, rush, not share I got, got something to do because I'm worried about. That means seconds, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> If your doctor allows it. Um, verse 9, the second area of joy that he recommends. Enjoy life with the wife you love all the days of your fleeting life, which has been given to you under the sun all your fleeting days. So the man with a thousand wives. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he recommends marital joy in your marital relations. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, read. And one of these days, maybe, you know, if I get old enough, we'll do the Song of Solomon. You know that he had one that he just, because that book gets darn steamy. Or he might have, because he had tried the other way, realized. Realized. You know what? Having multiple doesn't do it. Man, this is, well, I, and, and we can only speculate on that. But he said, here, at, at the, at Ecclesiastes, at the end of his life, here's another area for joy. Enjoy your spouse. Period. This verse, I think, shows that Solomon doesn't hate women. We kind of talked about that a couple of weeks ago. This is one of the ways of enjoying life comfortably and one of the principal ones that if a man has a wife, and remember he's writing to a male audience, if a man has a wife whom he ought to love as himself or as Christ loved the church, then he is to take delight in her company, <coughs> be pleasant with her, rejoice in her. Slap and tickle. <laughs> right up until the day. Yes, he did. Yeah, I did. He's, that's what he's saying. He said, 
enjoy your time with your wife. I am, yes, and he's going, move on. <laughs> the, third, the third area of joy that he recommends is your occupation in verse 10. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your strength because there is no work, planning, knowledge, or wisdom in the place of the dead in Sheol where you are going. So he said, enjoy what you do. Here's another area of joy. Whatever work that you've been given to do, while this work, while this does speak to work in general, again, without going into a bunch of Hebrew stuff, what this really focuses on is your regular duties that go into providing you a home and all the necessities of life. He said, take joy in doing that. Now, sometimes we don't do that. Sometimes when we're doing all the regular necessities of what it takes to have a home and keep up a home, a lot of work. it is work. <laughs> but Solomon says, you know what? Step back and enjoy the fact that you are able to do it. <laughs> that you have a home to take care of. As opposed to what we usually do, which is complaining and and he said, don't do it partially. Do it with all your strength. Put your whole effort into it. And this is really nothing more than the idea, like I said, of putting in your, your, your total effort. I'm not going to just, you know, kind of do it. Although I've been guilty of that more than once. But again, I have a wonderful spouse who reminds me of the times when I've only mailed it in instead of done it well. It's especially true of whatever God has given us to do. And, that, and particularly those things that look impossible because we can count on the promise of Philippians. Somebody look up that one. Philippians 4.13. For I can do everything. Okay, I, I figured somebody would have that memorized. I can do what? All things. Yeah. Through Christ. With the help of Christ who gives me the strength I need. And Solomon says, you know what? Do everything with that full strength. Whatever God has given you to do, do it with the joy that you have to be, that you can do it. Now, the reason for all this maximum effort is that there is no work, no planning, no knowledge, and no wisdom in the grave. He said, once you get there, all that's done. You can't do that one more time. You can't do anything that he just recommended. You can't enjoy your food and wine. You can't love your spouse. You can't work once you leave this place. And they are good things, and Solomon wants us to do them and enjoy them while we're here. These are very specific instructions on how to live that Solomon wrote down for us. Are they easy? No. Why not? Because we're human. Yeah, because of sin, because we're human. Why else? Suck us into this drama. Yeah. Now, we saw last week that he said wisdom has real value. In this last section, starting verse 11 through chapter 10, verse 1, we're also going to see that wisdom does have its limitations. So give me another reader. Starting verse 11, chapter 9, verse 10, through verse 10, chapter 1. Go ahead, one minute. I returned and saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. 
For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in the evil net, and as the birds that are caught in a snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great to me. How far? Uh, through chapter 10, verse there 1. There was a little city and few men within it, and there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words <coughs> of wise men are heard in quiet, more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. Chapter 10, verse 1. Oh, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth the stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Hmm. So he starts off with another observation there in verses 11 and 12. He, remember, he just advised us. What did he just advise us? That he advised us to work at whatever we've been given to do with all of our strength, but he's noticed something disturbing. He's noticed that there's no guarantee that just because you're the fastest, the strongest, the richest, the best educated, that you're going to end up on the top of the heap. He noticed that random, impersonal, uncaring chance affects, and timing affects everyone. You can be the best there is, and if your timing is off by this much, it doesn't mean nothing. And you can be the most marginal person on the planet in something, and if your timing lines up just perfectly, all of a sudden, you're on top of the world. And Solomon looks at that and says, oh man. He didn't abandon his earlier position that the will of God determines everything. He merely is looking at the seemingly arbitrary nature of this life from a human rather than a theological perspective. He's trying to look at it from like every other person on the planet would look like. He said, you know what? It's just, it oftentimes just comes down to random stinking chance. Basically, he has said what so many of us have said and what your kids, I know, have all said. Life's not fair. Life's not fair. <laughs> that ain't fair. Being fast, strong, rich, well engaged, working hard can promote, but cannot guarantee success. Now, your chances increase, but it does, there's no guarantee. And if that wasn't enough, you can be doing everything right and still find yourself trapped in an evil time. We're seeing that play out right now for believers in Ukraine. We saw that for believers around the world trapped in an evil time called the COVID pandemic. That even though they were living right, they were living according to God's word, they were sharing the good news, they were doing everything right, and COVID still caught them. And Solomon saw that too, and went back to that other premise. Wow, from a human perspective, it looks like life just isn't fair. To illustrate that, he, he gave us a parable, and it's the parable of this poor wise man and this great king that comes against him. So in the story, this poor but wise man is able to save his city from a siege by, by a very powerful king. So he thinks about it, he figures out, hey, here's what we need to do, we can stop this guy. He's just a poor guy, but man, he, he had the wisdom to figure out how to, how to hold this king off. And they win. The, 
They, they win the war, the siege works are taken down. And then what promptly, according to scripture in this parable, what promptly happens to this guy who saved the city from being ransacked by this opposing king? They forgot it. Okay, that was then, this is now, we're all doing good now. <laughs> My guess is that someone else took credit for the victory if modern day activities are any evidence of how people think. My guess is that some general said, yeah, yeah, this is what I did. Save the city. Um, wait a minute, didn't so-and-so tell you what to do? Yeah, but I'm the one who actually did it, so. So, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating here, but I've watched people enough to know that my guess is that in the parable that somebody else would have taken credit for it. Because you can't have a victory without somebody taking credit, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what happened in Esther, too, with her uncle? Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm going to take credit. So, he gives us this parable, and then he gives us a couple of observations and conclusions um, in verse 16. First off is good news. And he said the good news is that wisdom is better than strength. Here's a great king who comes marching in with his armies, has the wherewithal to build siege works, to set up, he's building ramps, he's going to take this. So he's coming in with power and strength and cash. And Solomon says, you know what, the first, the good news I've learned is that wisdom is better than strength. See, you may not be able to outrun, outfight, outspend an opponent, but if you can outthink him, you can still have a successful outcome. I have never been the fastest, strongest, best jumper, best shot, best anything. But I always try to outthink my opponent. And by doing so, I've had the blessings of having beat much better on paper opponents than me in sports and in my police career. Not because I was better. They were better. They were stronger. They were faster. But I was able to outthink them. This is why my kids love to play table games with dad. Because they know I'm going to try to outplay them. When we were at the, the, um, the picnic, we had a Connect Four, and I was doing that with the kids. And the, the kids started coming up, and they wanted to play me. They would have their siblings, their parents, that, no, I want to play you. I tried to beat them. <laughs> my grandpa was a champion checker player of Arizona. He had all the things. I played checkers with him forever. Never beat him. He would beat me every time. But he said, you're not going to learn if I let you win. Now, did I know my grandpa loved me to death? Absolutely. But he beat me every time. <laughs> and I would play these kids, and a few of the kids beat me. And I was like, oh, wow. And then they were thrilled. Ah! I beat the old guy. <laughs> but he said, good news, wisdom is better than strength. You can outthink probably far more often than you can out, you know, use your own natural ability. But there's bad news. If there's good news, there's always bad news. The bad news is that a poor but wise person is often overlooked. Who do we tend to turn to for advice in our country? People who are, yeah, successful, celebrities, people who are all over the media. But the poor but wise person who actually would have some outstanding good ideas, what do we do with them? Well, who are you? You're nobody. So again, nothing new. Look how often we get to hear from the, the ridiculous thoughts. Here's what I wrote. <laughs> Look how often we get to hear the ridiculous thoughts from Hollywood stars but never, but, and virtually never a well-reasoned, thought-out advice from somebody that doesn't have their name up on a marquee. So again, nothing new. Solomon looked at our society. 
He looked at people and realized that our society was going to mirror his and we're going to do it again. Then he closes this out. Well, hold on, before I go there, let me, what are your thoughts on this so far? Yeah, it speaks to today, totally. Has, has Ecclesiastes all felt very familiar to you so far? Yeah. And the man that said you learn from history was not correct. <laughs> well, you should, but people we should, don't. We should lots of things that we don't. There isn't. So he, he's going to close this out now with, with three more Proverbs. And they're kind of interesting. In verse 17, the words of a wise man are uttered and heard, Solomon says, relatively quietly, especially when they're compared to the shouting of a ruler who is leading a bunch of fools. Oh, man, does that sound familiar <laughs> in American politics. Right. That the well-reasoned thoughts of a wise man are not heard over the shouting of the nuts who happen to be in charge. And notice I didn't put a political party name in there. <laughs> because I found that description on both sides of that line. By being loud and bombastic, this ruler obtains authority amongst such fools as himself or herself, who are influenced more by the pomp and noise of the words than by the force of true wisdom and reason. Solomon saw American politics <laughs> before there was America. Read verse 17 again there. Blessed are you, land, when your king is a son of nobles and your princes feast at the proper time. Oh, excuse me, that's chapter 10. Let me go back. I thought, well, I'm already in chapter 11 in my slaves. Are we not? Yeah, that's, wait a minute, that's not right. Um, the calm words of the wise are heeded more than the shouts of a ruler over fools. And that's written in that pithy proverb style where he just it's just his one sentence thing. But then we look at it and say that's absolutely true. In our modern day, we've both seen this type of leader on both sides of the political aisle. But if you look through the history books, they're not new and they're not a modern invention. People will put up with them so much, and But there was a little little guy in Germany with a funny little mustache that was bombastic speaker and led a whole bunch of people who just went with that instead of using any well thought out reason. Wisdom, though, provides better security to a community than military strength, which is the ultimate form of violent political power. We're seeing that again play out with, with uh, Russia and Ukraine. And wisdom provides better security than military strength. Because you can have all the military strength in the world, and if you go up against wisdom, you may find yourself in a bogged down mess. And we're seeing that play out in absolute real time on the news today. Verse 18 and chapter 10, verse 1, are really linked. They're, they're two separate Proverbs, but they're really linked. And what Solomon sees here is that even a little stupidity, sin, can cancel out a great deal of wisdom, just like a few dead flies can make an ointment pretty darn disgusting. In context, the meaning here is that a foolish counselor, what he's talking about here is, is a foolish counselor uh, is a real danger to the state. If you get a, a counselor who's counseling the, the king, or in this case, a president, and he or she is just an absolute idiot, or crazy, 
then what kind of decisions are going to end up being made? And it doesn't take much. You can have him surrounded by a ton of wisdom, but you get that one little bit of foolishness, of stupidity, and it can cancel out a ton of wisdom. The teacher, though, isn't complaining. He's not complaining, saying, oh, this isn't fair. He's just saying that the wise are oftentimes simply ignored. Because it doesn't go along with a narrative. It doesn't go along with a visual. It doesn't promote what I want. And so I'm not going to listen to the wise because I have things that I want to do. And so I'll listen to just a little bit of stupidity and all the wise stuff that's being told gets thrown out. What he's saying here, I think, is that even when a lot of wisdom is present... that things can get really messed up by just a little bit of foolishness. Anybody ever seen that in, play out in your own life? My dad has a bunch of sayings that come up on my wall, and he reminded me, but one of them says, one oath crap takes away all the habit boys. Yeah, that was a common police yeah, yeah. saying, by the way, as well. Yeah, one, oh, mm, takes away, yeah. You can line up attaboys from now till, you know, the end of your career. You One good, oops, and all of a sudden all the attaboys go, Poof. The only guy, how much, okay, I'll finish. Quick story. <laughs> this guy was phenomenal. His name was Jeff. Good friend of my father-in-law's. He fought in Vietnam. He was a tunnel rat which meant he crawled down into those tunnels with a small flashlight and a 45 and killed VC under the ground in a little dark tunnel that often at times had booby traps. He got out of that, came here, became a police officer with Phoenix PD. Guess what he was afraid of? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Including guys that had stripes and bars and stars on their collar. He got a ton of, oh, golly gosh darns. But he also had a ton of, oh, wow. And about the time they were going to fire him, he would run into a house, a burnt house that was on fire, rescue two children and a box full of kittens, <laughs> and be all over the news, and the department would go, <laughs> guess we can't fire him. <laughs> <laughs> but for the rest of us, for the rest of us, one little piece of foolishness can just wipe out a ton of wisdom. So let me close with this question. Actually, I'll, I'll take a response or two. We, we've got just a minute or two on the clock. So what's the take home from chapter 9? What would you say, if you had to tell somebody, man, I went to Sunday school, here's what we did, here, what, what, what's your take home out of this? Because if we don't have a take home, all we've spent is an hour listening to me, you know, put air Always across my voice. What's that? <laughs> Always wear white. <laughs> yes! Which symbolizes what? <laughs> yeah, dress for, dress for joy for today. I would say, uh, be content and enjoy what God has given you because yeah, there are no guarantees. Start enjoying what you have now. You can't take it with you. You can't take, yeah. So I can, I can live out verse 7. Yeah, you're back to verse 7. <laughs> we have a new life verse. The new life speaks of it that your entire testimony can be destroyed with oneness. That's a great take home. Your entire testimony can be destroyed, a ton of wisdom, by one little piece of foolishness, mm -hmm. which means we have to guard against that. Yeah, Beck? Um, I'm not sure there's time for the question, but I'll pose it anyway. How do we balance this with, you know, he's, Solomon's saying, you know, everything, there's no more hope, there's no more living, there's no more all this once you die. How do we balance that with this message that we're giving that there's a heaven as soon as we pass away, that there's time to rise? Well, remember, he's writing this from a human perspective not a theological perspective. 
And how we balance is that is that God has given us these gifts, whatever they happen to be. And it, there is reality. I can't change my death. I can't change time of that. So I need to start living today, for today, in God's grace, enjoying what he, dressing in white, doing what I can do today, quit worrying about tomorrow. That's trying to catch the wind. And then we can go back into the rest and say what God's tomorrow looks like. But from a human perspective, for the right now, for today, I need to do that. Because do we really under, I hate to say this as, as a pastor, do we even really understand heaven all that well? No. No, we don't. All we know is it's going to be way cool. Really. Other than that, we don't have a lot of discussion in Scripture. We have these little fuzzy, glimpsy picture things. So Solomon says, you know what? I would, I'm not even, I believe that. He never disregards that God's in control of everything. But he said, start focusing right now. If I can get you to do that, then we'll take care of tomorrow. Yeah, and the thing for the believer is since time is limited, we need to be doing God's work in that limited time. Yeah. We need to be sharing the gospel so other people can be there. We should be storing up our treasure in heaven. So it's a reminder for the believer just as well to, you know, enjoy life but get out of it. And that was one of the three areas of joy that he really focused on was your occupation. And part of our occupation is to be doing just that. Last comment, we'll close. You know, the, I think that example, so, and, and I call it the window of opportunity. If you're happy, you're joyful, you're enjoying life, you don't walk around with this miserable face on, or people will ask you, why are you so happy? It's, it's kind of your comment in the line, how are you doing? And it's that window of opportunity that we will be able to say, well, this is why I'm so happy. Mm -hmm. And it's given by by God himself. The joy, the happiness, the peace. The, and All of that fruit of the Spirit stuff. And it is the new covenant. And Solomon was living under the old covenant. Yes, he was still living under the word. We have the new covenant, the promise of Jesus Christ, the gift of salvation that he had not been given. Yes. He was still looking forward to it as a hope of a coming Messiah. We get, we're on the backside looking the other direction. Excellent. You guys are spot on. Uh, Bill, would you go ahead and close this? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your many blessings. I thank you for your love, your mercy, and grace that you show upon us each and every day, Lord. Father, I just thank you for Pastor Harry, Lord, and trying to put in a phenomenal message, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that each and every day that we're able to get up and just see, Lord, that you've made this day. I pray, Lord, that we're able to walk in with the joy that you've given us, Lord. Father, I just ask you that you put your hand upon, Lord, just the chaos that's, that's going on in, in this world right now, Lord. I pray, Lord, that as the, Lord, the believers, Lord, that we, just, we stand strong and know that you are in control. We didn't wake up today and get surprised by anything, Father. I just ask you, Lord, that Lord, we just stand firm in you, in your reality, Lord, and know that it's all okay. I just pray, Father, for, for Pastor Gary, Lord, in today's message, Lord. I pray for, Lord, that, that we open our hearts and, and just accept it, Lord, and, and walk by it, Lord. I thank you for all things, Lord. I thank you for just another day that we're able to get up, Lord. I thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Chapter 10 for next week, if you want to read ahead.